Welcome back to this series of lectures on the introduction to Spintronics. My name is Aurélien Manchon. I'm an associate professor of applied physics at KAUST, and I will be your guide through this fifth lecture. In the previous lecture, we have seen that we can describe the magnetization dynamics using the landau lachis gibbert equation. We have applied this knowledge to describe the magnetization reversal and the ferromagnetic resonance of a uniformly magnetized sample. Actually, in most samples of interest, the magnetization breaks down into domains to minimize the overall dipolar energy. In this lecture, we are going to better understand the nature of these domains, what happens at the boundary, and how we can move them. Let's move on. In this part, we are going to focus on the static properties of the boundary between two magnetic domains called a magnetic domain wall. We'll first look at the impact of the dipolar coupling on the magnetization and see how it gives rise to magnetic textures. Then we will explore the nature of those domain walls in one and two dimensions. And finally, we are going to look at the impact of the Jaurisin scheme area interaction on those domains and see how it gives rise to textures with a defined chirality. Let's go. To understand how inhomogeneous magnetic domains emerge, let us consider the following macromagnetic energy with magnetic exchange and isotropy and demagnetization. If the exchange is much larger than the other energy terms, the magnetic moments of a given magnetic object remain aligned with each other and no magnetic texture can be stabilized. As we have seen previously, the dipolar energy can be modeled by a constant demagnetizing tensor in this case. On the downside, this homogeneous magnetic distribution accumulates magnetic charges on opposite edges of the sample, creating a strong demagnetizing field. In the opposite case, if the dipolar energy dominates, it tries to minimize the magnetic flux radiated by the magnetic object. Based on this idea, Vandenberg proposed a geometrical method to construct the distribution of the magnetic moments inside a given magnetic material. The cancellation of the magnetic charges at the surface of a magnetic volume imposes that the divergence of the magnetization vector vanishes. This means that the magnetic moments must be parallel to the interface. This is illustrated here, here, and here. Now, there are regions of the object where the magnetization direction changes abruptly. One can identify these boundaries by drawing increasingly large circles from regions of sharp curvature. The position of the center of these circles defines the boundary between homogeneous magnetic domains. I can do it also from this point and from this point. The three lines meet in the center of the object and I can use them to draw the general form of the magnetic texture. Here you go. Now, keep this construction in mind because whenever this is possible, Whenever the exchange is not too strong, the magnetization will always tend to minimize the dipolar coupling by adopting such a twisted configuration. The very complex distribution of the magnetization is quite different from the microspins case and displays lines of abrupt changes of direction. Such lines are called domain walls and is the focus of the present lecture. Let's take another classical example. Consider a rectangular magnet, the same magnet we looked at in the introduction. If all the magnetic moments are aligned, the magnet radiates a large tray field. To reduce this tray field, I can flip half of the magnetic moments downward. This comes at the expense of creating a domain wall and does reduce significantly the radiated tray field. I can do better and create more anti-parallel magnetic domains. I thus create more domain walls, but reduce the stray field further. Another method to reduce the stray field 
is to create magnetic domains with magnetic moments forming an extended vortex configuration. I can create even more of these extended vortices, which reduces the overall stray field, but always come at the expense of additional domain walls. Now you see that you cannot repeat this procedure indefinitely, because each magnetic domain wall you create costs energy. As a consequence, the magnetic texture of a given material comes out of a compromise between the magnetic exchange, the anisotropy, and the dipolar energy. The average size of the magnetic domains is then characterized by a so-called exchange length that is roughly proportional to the square of the ratio between the magnetic exchange energy and the anisotropy energy. Depending on which mechanism defines the anisotropy, either the magnetocrystalline anisotropy or the dipolar energy, you can define different exchange length for a given material. Let me close this brief discussion with a couple of experimental images. The top view is an example of these diamond domains I just mentioned and that arise in micro wires. The bottom image is a picture of a magnetic maze formed by magnetic domains in a large sample of a few tens of microns. What I'd like to talk about now is what happens at the boundary between two adjacent domains. So what happens between two homogeneous magnetic domains? The simplest domain wall structures you can think of are shown here. On the left, you have the block wall where the magnetization in the center of the wall points perpendicular to the direction of the wall. On the right, you have the Nehe wall, where the magnetization in the center of the wall points along the direction of the wall. What is the difference between these two walls? In the block wall, the magnetic charges remain away from each other all along the wall, so a priori you would expect the dipolar energy to be somewhat satisfied. In the nail wall, the magnetic charges strongly interact in the center of the wall, so you expect a large concentration of dipolar energy in the center. So, from the energetics point of view, block walls are more likely to occur than nail walls. Of course, this statement is not general and strongly depends on the details of the energy landscape, as we will see in a few slides. So let's focus on the block wall and see how it emerges from the competition between exchange and an isotropy. Here is the magnetic energy we are going to consider, composed of exchange and uniaxial anisotropy along Z. The domain wall extends along the x direction and is parameterized by the polar angle between the magnetization and the anisotropy axis theta. What we're looking for is an expression of the domain wall profile. In other words, we need to derive the expression of the polar angle theta as a function of the position x. The function theta of x is such that it minimizes the total magnetic energy. To do so, we will use a variational approach and compute the change of energy induced by a small change in the theta function. We obtain this expression that we can reduce this way. Now, we want to cancel the integrand, which leads us to a second order differential equation on theta. Remarkably, this equation is solvable exactly. We first multiply both sides by d theta over dx, integrate it, and obtain a first order differential equation. Now we separate the variables theta and x and integrate it to obtain this nice relation. And finally, we get the expression of the profile of the block wall. Here is a picture of the magnetization profile along the wall. So, at plus and minus infinity, the angle theta is equal to zero and pi, respectively. Which means that the homogeneous magnetic domains are aligned along plus zine and minus zine, respectively.
and close to the center of the wall, the my component is non-zero, as given by the expression of theta. Now, let's look at the parameters that determine the shape of the wall. The angle theta depends on only one parameter, delta. Delta is given by the square root of the ratio between the exchange and the anisotropy. So the larger the exchange, the longer the domain wall, because the canting between neighboring magnetic moments must remain small to satisfy the magnetic exchange. In contrast, if the anisotropy is large, the domain wall tends to be much shorter to minimize the length over which the magnetic moments point away from the anisotropy axis. Notice that delta is not the domain wall width, though. The domain wall width can be determined from the tangent of the mz component close to the center of the wall and is equal to pi times delta. Finally, the total energy of the wall is given by the square root of the product of the exchange and the anisotropy. You see that it is always positive, so it does cost energy to create a wall. The theory we have just seen does not take into account the actual shape of the magic object. If one were to take this shape into account, one should consider the role of the demagnetizing field. For instance, if I consider a thick enough magnetic layer with in-plane magnetic anisotropy, the block configuration should be favored. But upon reducing the thickness of the magnetic layer, the magnetic charges induced by the block wall start to see each other, and there's a critical thickness below which the nail configuration would be favored. This tendency is illustrated on the central graphs. The top graph shows the evolution of the energy of block and nail walls in an in-plane magnetized layer as a function of the thickness, while the bottom graph shows the evolution of the corresponding domain wall width. But you see that there is a clear crossover between nail and block configurations. One can apply the same reasoning to a perpendicularly magnetized wire. If the cross section is wide, the block wall is favored. But upon narrowing the wire, the nail wall will be favored for the same reason we just evoked. The dipolar coupling favors nail wall when reducing the width of the magnetic wire. The previous discussion applies to one-dimensional or quasi-one-dimensional magnetic systems. In other words, to magnetic systems in which the magnetic texture can only develop along one direction. This happens when the lateral size of the system is much smaller than the exchange length. Remember our discussion of Vandenberg construction. Whenever it is possible, so as long as the exchange length is smaller than the system size, the magnetization tends to twist in order to minimize the dipolar coupling. In the present case, when the width of the nanowire exceeds the exchange length, the transverse wall transforms into a vortex wall. Here is the paper I like. Using spin polarized scanning electron microscopy on a permalloy wire, the authors image the transformation between transverse and vortex walls. This transformation is triggered by spin transfer torque, which means that it is a non-equilibrium process. Indeed, what we just said is that for a given exchange length, vortex walls are favored over transverse walls when the width of the wire is large. In this experiment, the width doesn't change, but energy is provided to the system via the flowing charge current which enables a transformation from a stable vortex wall to an unstable transverse wall. Let's look at another interesting magnetic texture that appears in two dimensions. I'll consider first an in-plane magnetized sample with a nail wall along the length of the wire. This happens if the shape and isotropy is large. You see that this configuration requires a very long nail wall, which is unlikely to be stable for large samples. Indeed, 
when the width of the sample increases, you obtain what is called a cross-tie domain wall. This wall consists in a succession of vortices separated by abrupt nail walls. If I draw a line across the vortex core, I obtain a block wall. If I draw a line along the edge of the vortex, I obtain a nail wall. But you see the two consecutive nail walls have opposite chirality. So there is an abrupt change in the magnetization texture in this region. This is called a cross tie. You can see the magnetization profile of such a cross tie domain wall measured on permaloid by magneto optical care effect. You retrieve the vortex cores, and these vertical lines here are the cross tie domain walls separating nail walls of opposite chirality. Finally, I'd like to talk about the last class of magnetic objects that are uncontrolled in thick perpendicularly magnetized samples. When the sample is thick enough so that the demagnetizing field competes with the perpendicular anisotropy, you can stabilize magnetic bubbles. For instance, take a perpendicularly magnetized material with magnetization pointing down. Let's apply a perpendicular field pointing up. At some location in the sample, the magnetization gets reversed and you can nucleate a magnetic domain that remains stable. The reason this bubble doesn't expand and completely reverses the magnetization of the material is because of the surface tension of the magnetic domain wall, representing in pink color. Because of the demagnetization, the magnetization likes to be in plane but not too much. So this domain wall doesn't expand. Unless you increase the external field, you end up with a stable magnetic bubble. Note that the energetics does not impose any specific chirality, and the magnetization direction inside the domain wall itself can take various directions, such as these ones. On the right, I give an experimental image of such a bubble taken in the group of Sungbun Choi. The different shades of gray tell you how the bubble expands when you increase the field. This kind of bubble has very important historical significance. It was massively studied in the 70s and exploited as a bit of information by Bell Labs, IBM, and so on for non-volatile magnetic bubble memory application. This field of research died out in the 80s and came back aggressively a few years ago with the discovery of magnetic squamions. And that's what we are going to talk about right now. We have seen in a previous lecture that when a magnetic crystal lacks inversion symmetry, an antisymmetric exchange interaction emerges known as the jaworzynski moria interaction. In contrast with Heisberg exchange that favors collinear spin arrangement, the jaworzynski moria interaction favors canted magnetic arrangement. You can find it in bulk crystals lacking an inversion center or at interfaces. In the limit of smooth magnetic textures, when the magnetization gradient is small, the jaworzynski moria interaction reduces to this expression, where Dij is an element of the jaworzynski moria tensor. To understand what happens when jaworzynski moria interaction is turned on, let us consider a spin chain along X, defined by the following energy density. As usual, we have the magnetic exchange, the jaworzynski moria interaction, the perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, and some dipolar energy. Notice that the form of the jaworzynski moria interaction we chose here is appropriate to interfaces normal to the z-axis. So this energy typically models a perpendicularly magnetized spin chain close to an interface. To analyze the influence of jaworzynski moria interaction, we will consider a spin spiral and compute its total energy. The polar angle is simply proportional to the position x and the azimuthal angle is assumed to be constant. By injecting the expression of the spin spiral into the energy density, we obtain this expression. The exchange gives a quadratic dispersion, as expected. The jaworzynski schemory interaction gives a linear contribution and the anisotropy produces a shift in energy.
Now let's consider the two typical classes of spin spirals. In the Neal case, the azimuthal angle is fixed to zero, and the spiral rotates perpendicular to the xz plane. The total energy is given here. We'll come back to it in a minute. Alternatively, we can also have the block spin spiral that rotates around the x-axis and possesses the following energy. Let us now compare these two energies. In the case of a block spin spiral, you see that the Josephson schemer interaction is absent by symmetry, and the overall energy is always positive. So this spin spiral has no chance to be stable. In contrast, the nail spin spiral possesses a Josephson schemer contribution whose sign depends on the spin spiral wave vector q. So, depending on the magnitude and sign of this wave vector, it is possible to minimize the magnetic energy. This is in fact achieved for a nail spin spiral of the wave vector q equals d over 2a. So in other words, we just demonstrated that the Josephson schema interaction can stabilize homochiral spin spirals. So if Josephson schema interaction is large enough, spin spirals with a defined chirality become the ground state. That is great news, but as you can see, to stabilize spin spirals, the Josephson schema interaction needs to compete with both the exchange and the anisotropy. Showing strong ferromagnets like transition metal compounds, it is unlikely that spin spiral states can be stabilized, and you often end up with a homogeneous ferromagnetic state as a ground state. Nonetheless, even in this configuration, Josephson schema interaction can play an important role. Let us consider such a situation where exchange and anisotropy dominate and the ground state is ferromagnetic. Now, for the Josephson schema interaction to be active in this situation, you need to create some sort of spin texture. Let's implement a domain wall then. If the Josephson schema interaction is not too large, the profile of the wall is given by this expression that we derived previously, and the resulting energy is given here you immediately see the competition between the Josephson schema interaction and the dipolar interaction, depending on the azimuthal angle of the wall, phi zero. To obtain the value of phi zero, we minimize this energy and get the following graph. This picture was obtained in the pioneering work of André Thiaville, where the physics of Josephson schema domain walls is discussed. In ordinates, you have the equilibrium component of the magnetic moments in the center of the domain wall, and in abscise, the value of the Josephson schema interaction. In the absence of Josephson schema interaction, the wall is in a block configuration as dictated by the dipolar energy. Upon increasing Josephson schema interaction, the magnetization in the wall progressively tilts away from the y direction and gets oriented along the domain wall direction. When the Josephson schema interaction is large enough, the wall is therefore in a nail configuration and stays there. The critical Josephson schema interaction at which this transition happens is given by this expression, and it determines the boundary between intermediate and pure nail wall configurations. This transition is of utmost importance for applications because nail walls can reach very high velocities when driven by a current. Actually, even more exciting magnetic textures can be stabilized by the Josephson schema interaction. To see that, we will follow the very influential work of Bogdanov and Russler and consider a perpendicularly magnetized ferromagnet with exchange, Josephson schema interaction, and perpendicular anisotropy. In their model, the authors also allowed the magnitude of the Josephson schema interaction to vary in space but that is not crucial for our discussion. I am now looking for a cylindrically symmetric solution of this energy functional. By adopting the cylindrical parametrization given here, I obtain a second order differential equation that I need to solve. The solution of this equation is given in this picture. You see that the solution is a localized magnetic texture with cylindrical symmetry. If you draw a line along the diameter of the texture, 
you retrieve the nail spin spiral I discussed above. Notice that the particular manner the spin processes along this line depends on the specific form of the Josephson-Ski Maria interaction, and I don't want to enter in these details here. This magnetic entity is a topological soliton. In other words, there is no way you can remove it without switching the central magnetic moment. If you do so, though, the entire topology of the magnetic system will be lost, and you recover a featureless ferromagnetic state. For this reason, this object has been called a magnetic skirmion, in reference to Tony Skirm, who first proposed topological solitons as means to model elementary quantum particles. Let's see how this non-trivial topology translates in the context of the magnetic skirmion. The magnetization looks like that. It has rotational symmetry, so that its polar angle is independent on the angle phi, and its azimuthal angle is independent on the radius rho. In the simple context of the skirmion presented here, the azimuthal angle, which quantifies the manner the magnetic moments rotate along the skirmion radius, can be parameterized by its helicity gamma and its vorticity m. Because it is topological, the structure of the skirmion is characterized by a topological invariant that is to say, an integer that does not depend on the local geometry of the structure, but only on its global shape. This topological number, also called the skirmion number, is defined as the integral of the solid angle span by the magnetization vector. By considering the symmetry properties of the skirmion, this integral reduces to this expression which gives that the skirmion number is simply equal to the vorticity. You see that this number does not depend on the exchange, charizinski moria interaction, or even on the particular profile of the interaction along Z. It is an integer that characterizes its topology, but not its peculiar geometry. This is why magnetic skirmions belong to a vast class called topological defects. A last remark is in order. If you find the right material for which such a skirmion is the ground state, you can expect this skirmion to appear in a periodic manner in the form of a skirmion crystal. This is actually the form under which these skirmions were first discovered about 10 years ago. Skirmions are currently a very hot research topic in spintronics, and I cannot cover all their fascinating aspects in this lecture. So I really encourage you to have a closer look to the excellent reviews available to learn more about this very rich field of research. Let's see how it looks like in real life. One of the first observations of the magnetic skirmions was performed on iron cobalt silicon compound. This material presents weak magnetism and crystallizes in the B20 crystal structure, which is a non-centrosymmetric cubic structure. To the lowest order in the magnetization gradient, the jerusinski moria interaction looks like this. The pictures I'm going to show have been taken using Lorentz TM in the group of Yoshinori Tokura. This technique allows for imaging the direction of the magnetization vector. So at low temperature, when applying an external magnetic field, you can obtain spin spirals, pretty much like the ones we just discussed. Upon increasing the temperature, you obtain a phase where you have something like a mixture between spin spirals and some localized magnetic skirmions, as shown by the right arrows here. Increase a bit more the temperature, and you get the skirmion crystal with a hexagonal lattice. The reason why the magnetic skirmions are obtained upon increasing the temperature is a bit complex and has to do with the manner the micromagnetic energy terms vary with the temperature. However, if you increase the temperature too much, thermal fluctuations destroy the magnetic order. By performing this experiment for various applied fields, you obtain the following phase diagram, which shows a large region where skirmions crystals appear in red. These skirmions are organized in crystals and exist only at low temperature. 
A very important discovery of the past few years has been the observation of metastable skirmions at room temperature in transition metal multilayers. In this case, the Joseon-Schimera interaction arises at the interface between two dissimilar metals, as we discussed previously. The top picture shows an experiment performed by Gong Shen in iron-nickel multilayers, where the magnetic skirmions are stabilized. Now, these skirmions are not a ground state anymore, so they are not organized in crystal. This is very interesting for applications because one can use individual skirmions to convey information, for instance. Another experiment was performed by Wang Jung Zhang in the group of Axel Hoffman and shows the blowing of magnetic skirmions in conventional tantalum cobalt iron borne bilayers. Many more work has been achieved in this direction in the past few years, and amazing progress has been made toward the design and the realization of actual skirmion devices. I will conclude this part by mentioning an interesting counterpart to magnetic skirmions. The magnetic skirmions I discussed so far were obtained in perpendicularly magnetized materials. Now, it is possible to obtain topological solitons in in-plane magnetized materials. Such a structure is called a meron. On the left, you have a picture of such a meron crystal in cobalt, zinc, manganese material. You see that the magnetic texture resembles the one of a lattice of magnetic vortices. You can identify merons and antimerons. Interestingly, why magnetic skirmions are characterized by a topological invariant that is an integer, merons and antimerons are characterized by an invariant that is half an integer. This is important because it means that a meron cannot appear alone. It needs to appear coupled with an antimeron, always by pair. Finally, I'd like to mention an interesting idea put forward by the group of Ingrid Mertig. They propose that in easy plane magnets, with this form of joseon schimera interaction, one can stabilize metastable bimerons. These bimerons are really the counterpart of skirmions and can be manipulated and used to convey information. We have explored the nature of magnetic domain walls in one and two dimensions. We have seen how the joseon schimera interaction can stabilize homochiral domain walls, skirmions, merons, and so on. Now what I would like to understand is how I can move the structures applying an external magnetic field. And that's what I'm going to do in the next part.